I'm Dump Truck DS. Hey, wait a minute. Why am I low res? Not too long ago, the channel surpassed the 500 subscriber milestone. To celebrate, I'm busting out some archival footage that I shot back at QuakeCon 2000. I shot a ton of video and I still need to go through it all. Um, and I'm gonna have some more QuakeCon videos up in the future. But for this one, I decided to share John Carmack's talk that he does every year. As I said, this is from the year 2000. And to really appreciate this, you need some historical perspective, both of the game industry and on id software. The PlayStation 2, the Dreamcast, and the Nintendo 64 were the consoles on the market at the time. The original Xbox was still over a year away at this point, but this talk is about the console market and how it related to id at the time. For id software, they had just begun working on Doom 3 a couple months before, and it was still shrouded in secrecy. The Quake 3 Mission Pack Team Arena had been out for about six months at this point. If you read the excellent book, Masters of Doom, uh, you'll know that id Software was a place of high drama at this time in their history. Before I get out of your face, please note that this video has been edited. It's not the entire talk, but it's most of it. I had some technical difficulties that day. Enjoy. Okay, uh, the last talk I gave at the CPL event, I wound up putting people to sleep in the front row, so I, you know, no discussions about light transport, ocular phenomena, and all that this time. <laughs> technical people can catch me afterwards, and, you know, that are out of about those things. <laughs> but uh, the main thing that I wanted to talk about really is the platform issues, where especially, like even in one of my interviews yesterday, the topic came up, it's just this horrible question, it's such a cliche, is the PC dead? And you know, the big thing here is from Sony's marketing push for the PlayStation 2 over the last year, and it had been really pretty interesting to watch, where in the PC industry, like a lot of the hardware card vendors and game developers and publishers, that you know, many of them really should have kind of known better in a lot of ways, but they were, they were so kind of awed and dumbstruck by what Sony was able to pull over in the marketing campaign and all this, that there are just like a whole lot of people that are going through the, the PC is doomed, you know, the console markets, the consoles are so powerful now, they're gonna take over, they're gonna be able to do all this and that, and like, what's the point of even making PC games anymore if you're going to have 40 million PlayStation 2s or whatever doing that development work? <laughs> Now, some of that is starting to kind of wear off a little bit now, where there was this period where everyone was just absolutely certain that it was kind of over. And the uh, I, I've been pretty happy to see the fact that the Dreamcast has actually exceeded sales expectations, because everyone was thinking, it's like, oh, this is a write-off, Sony steamroller's coming, and there's just going to be nothing left. You know, it's going to be the Sony PlayStation 2, and you know, maybe Microsoft will fight out for a little while with the Xbox or whatever. But, you know, as we're seeing, of course, now, where people that have played PlayStation 2 and all that, uh, it's a good machine. It's the most powerful console ever made. You know, every console that comes out in a newer time frame is always the most powerful console ever made. Dreamcast is the most powerful console shipped in America right now. And that's certainly going to continue. But, you know, it's not the, you know, the analogies that they were saying about, like, the invention of the steam engine or whatever. It's just, you know, another couple of cranks of Moore's Law on the, you know, on the gaming platform. Now, the more interesting questions will be, once you start saying things like, they are powerful enough now to do basically anything that you do on a PC, and with the you know, kind of advent of internet connections and such into the gaming, the really interesting questions do start coming up on console platforms, where if the console stays as a conventional console, where it's a stateless machine, where you stick the CD or DVD or whatever in, close it, you play the game, you have a good time, you go on. And clearly that's something that just kind of sits alongside the PC. You know, there are games that you play on there, they're nice and easy, and there's certainly things that, are, that work better and uh, are less likely to have problems on the console platform. But you know, that would not be any reason for people to say, it's like, oh, is the PC doomed for all this? The, uh, you know, the analogies that come in that make people think about that are first is just kind of specsmanship. When people write up the specs for all this and they say, look, it's 100 times more powerful than anything else with two orders of magnitude, nothing else matters. And of course, you know, a lot of that, again, which is why I was somewhat disturbed when the technical people bought so much of this hook, line, and sinker. Because if you've been around for like a few generations of this and you've worked on these things, you know, and you look at the spec and say, wow, this is going to be wonderful. I'm not going to have to work very hard. I'll just, you know, toss everything down and it'll magically work. And of course, it doesn't actually turn out like that. And when you start looking at this, it's like, oh, however many billion operations per second. And you start looking, and it's like, okay, well, this is great, but it has like no L2 cache, so 90% of all of our operations wind up going through at some you know, much, much lower rate of speed. Um, 
So in the end, you wind up with something that, yes, it has the best price performance of anything, but when you look at the PlayStation 2 specs a year ago when they were first leaked, you'd say, it's like, okay, this is lots more powerful than our current PCs. But if you look at them right now, and you look at everything and you say, even today's PC hardware is more powerful than a PlayStation 2. I mean, no matter what some of these marketing people wind up saying about it, you can do more with, say, an MB15 based graphics card on uh, you know, a gigahertz Pentium 3 or something. You know, of course, it costs eight times as much or something. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's a perfectly valid reason to have uh, the console as a low, you know, low power, low price thing. But it doesn't wind up being the, it's an order of magnitude more powerful, all the best games will necessarily be on this platform. And when you start looking forward towards, you know, a year from now or whatever, uh, we'll have the Xbox out on the console platform. And then again, everybody's like, oh, but this really is a PC. It's everything like a PC except cheaper and it's going to be more stable and hopefully this, that, and the other. Um, but then you look at that again and say, well, these figures look great now because we're sitting in like NVIDIA's MD10, MD15 generation and they're talking MD20 specs. But of course, by the time you can buy an Xbox, you will be having another half generation step past that in the PC systems. So the argument of kind of obsolescence by just overpowering uh, just really doesn't work out. It works out great for, you know, for the marketing of consoles the year before they launch. Because if you're talking about something that's a year or two years into the future, of course it's going to sound incredibly wonderful. But it doesn't wind up actually having that much of the impact on you know, what you're able to do with the system and the time frame when it actually is available. Um, the, you know, the other aspect that people are looking at now when you start saying, well, these are powerful enough well, the older game consoles were clearly toys. You know, you have your Super Nintendo or something at time frame when you have a 32-bit PC operating system, and here you're doing something that's you know a little 816-bit processor. It's clearly in a very different order there. If game consoles stay true to themselves, if a game console stays a game console, then I believe that the status quo that we've had, you know, the last decade really stays the same, where a game console will have tighter program games that exploit the hardware better, that can in, in some ways provide a better, more stable user experience, uh, or just pop them in and play the game and everything. But if console people wind up pursuing things where they say, well, this is a computer, this can do everything that a computer can, then it becomes a more matter of like, it's not a game console versus a PC, it's a matter of a PC versus another computing platform. And the question then of like PlayStation or Dreamcast versus the PC almost becomes a lot closer to like PC versus Mac or Linux, where if you bring, if you kind of cross that divide and say we're no longer the stateless console game, we're going to have like being able to plug in arbitrary devices and have drivers or have a hard drive or have internet access, all of those are kind of steps along the, the slippery slope to actually being a new computing platform. Now, that would actually be kind of interesting in many ways if it could be pulled off, where a stable hardware platform that doesn't have the uh, you know, kind of flexibility of the PC, it's both its strength and weakness, where the great part on the PC is to be able to like, every month or so there's some brand new piece of hardware that you can talk about and plug in and experiment with and uh, you know, explore kind of the new feature set space that you've got there. And that's a fun part of developing on PCs and targeting games at them, being able to just like grab new features and like work it into what you're doing and see something that like nobody's been able to do before because it just became possible. You know, you just got the new hardware or just got the new accessories or something like that. And that's contrasted with the console programming experience where that has its own kind of, you know, unique vibe for a programmer where you've got a fixed platform and you can say, you know, I'm going to work on this, I know exactly what's going to be targeted and you can really make your work count. Like, on the console, if you go in and say, well, this core routine is taking 100 cycles now, and you optimize it down, it's 80 cycles, that means every single person that plays your game gets that, you know, gets that benefit. And if you think you're 10% too slow, you work on it until you're fast enough for everyone. Well, in the PC space, because you've got this constantly changing landscape of, you know, which speed computers everyone has, a developer, instead of saying it's like, well, we're, you know, we're going to sweat a little bit over this and make it a little bit faster. You can practically just say to yourself, well, we're going to slip a couple weeks and the whole market will be 10% faster. And you know, that's really effectively how it works out. I mean, there's a lot of important PC games that, you know, that found out it's like, wow, we're way under target and it's, but, well, we're going to be late anyway, so we'll be just fine. Uh, I mean, it, it literally happens like that. There is this strong kind of disincentive to spend time optimizing. Where, and also, in some ways, to spend time like, making things really robust. Because the thought is that 
you know, you can always, like, on the PC, we can get something out. People love the features. They want to see lots of flash and bullet points and all that. And, you know, it's okay even to perhaps be somewhat unstable on the start because people are expecting to grab their patches from the internet. And that's probably, it's probably not a good thing, but even there, you can't positively sit down and say for sure that, of course, people would like to say, on general principle, one should never ship, like, stuff until it's, like, rock solid, you know, as perfect as possible. But the PC market would be very different if people took that tack, and there would be some positive things lost. You know, I'm not going to go on, you know, on record and say it's like, oh, it's good to rush things out the door, but that's, I, that a lot of what makes things vibrant in the PC market really is about not trying to make things perfect, but trying to make things like quickly and fast and exploit new things and kind of show people new and different areas. And that's one reason why the console games are more stable in so many ways, because they don't have that kind of drive and impetus to do that. And it does make the games, from many people's judges of quality, much better. There's the kind of development item, you know, the kind of impetuses that you have there, because you know you can't patch it, you're going to have to spend more time on this. And then there's the actual hardware constraints. You know, it makes a heck of a lot of difference. Um, and the Dreamcast has been a great example, where everybody that's gone over and played the Dreamcast there, where hardware spec-wise, it's a quarter of the spec of what, you know, somebody's playing a high-end PC game on right now. You know, one-fourth of the power, but it looks great. You know, it, the game comes over really well, and that's because when you know you've got a fixed platform there, you go over and you go ahead and optimize to that platform. Things that we've never done on the PC space because we're like, oh, do we really want to, like, make per card texture compressed versions? Uh, will that over, you know, overflow our CD, or will we just have to go and check all these different things because we've got six different video cards that we care about running on. While when you're on a platform, a console platform, you just go through, and instead of just saying, okay, everything's compressed or uncompressed, you wind up running them all through, and you make kind of per texture decisions. Like, okay, this looks good, this looks like crap compressed, so we'll use 8-bit instead of, uh, you know, BQ or something on there. And those types of decisions let you get, I would say, on average, a console for a given amount of hardware is two to three times better game quality to optimize for it than you get on the PC just because you're able to like, exactly take kind of maximum advantage of it. So there's, there's interesting things like that, and some of the, the parallel, like if the consoles did become a new platform, it would be in many ways kind of like the Amiga and the Atari ST days, which while they, you know, they clearly didn't win in terms of the PC space, they were interesting in terms of the, you know, the cultures and the genres that would happen there when you've got a, you know, a close to the hardware uh, approach on a general PC. Now, I mean, that is my opinion of why those, that was both the strength and the downfall of those platforms, where the strength of it is you get stuff that far outpaces what you do on other platforms with similar costs because you're going directly to the hardware, but there's no evolutionary path for it. You know, you can't very nicely go ahead and take something that's hardcore optimized for one particular thing and then expect it to, you know, grow and evolve and scale to the other platforms. While on the PC, really everybody's saying more or less, like, well, maybe this isn't the best bus or processor or graphics chip or whatever. Um, the, you know, there will be this level of scalability. You know, it'll work well here, it'll work not so well in earlier stuff, and it'll work better on newer stuff. And that is the trade-off that you make. You choose scalability over kind of focused dedication on there. Although it is interesting to look at just those things that people would always rattle off about PCs. You know, not the best graphics, not the best bus, not the best processor. Truth is, PCs do have the best of all of those right now, and that's been something that's just been, you know, really aggressively changed in the last several years. As you know, it's it's almost sad looking at all the workstation companies now, uh, just because the PC platform really is the cutting edge, and it's still the cutting edge compared to the consoles. It just doesn't get utilized as fully because of the kind of general purpose scalable nature of it. Now, the other aspect of the console stuff, like standing in as a PC is going to be how they interact with the internet. And that's one of the, the really huge questions that if, P, if consoles were sold at a profit, then I think they could clearly be made just, you know, you can do anything you want over the internet and you can just go ahead and make it a really cheap type of computer there. And I think that would be a nice thing, kind of filling the, the niche that the Amiga had, where here's maybe your sub $500 computer that does really whiz-bang cool stuff there. But the internet is really a scary issue to console developers, or to console producers, because the whole issue of the console is very much predicated on the fact that you've got a royalty stream from all the games that, that play on it. 
where early on, you know, in the first I don't know, maybe year of the process until they get some of their cost reduction stuff down, they lose money on every console that's sold. So they're like, you know, the a statistic that's I, you know, some people have taken some joy in is that like apparently in Japan half of the Sony PlayStation 2s are being some, you know, are like not buying games. They're using the cheap DVD player. So of course Sony's competitors just love that. You know, Sony's pouring you know lots of money down subsidizing people's DVD players. I, so but the way that ties in with the internet is uh, if a developer, if a console producer is expecting that they need to recoup their costs by getting royalty streams on everything that plays on there, then the issue about anybody deriving any kind of content enjoyment from the platform without paying a royalty stream is a really significant thing that undermines the entire kind of basis the way consoles are rolled out. So, on the one hand, you've got the, the fairly easy decision where you say, it's like, oh, we'll put in a web browser and we'll let people go ahead and browse around the web. Uh, and while it's content that people are viewing on there, people do all this stuff, you know, with the one, you know, the one browser thing that came with the game, it's not really that big of a deal. It doesn't, like, directly assault or cut into any of the, you know, our mainstream effects on there. But when you start going a little bit further, you say, well, are we going to let them run, uh, like, Flash or Shockwave or, you know, Java applications or something on there? And at that point, you're like, well, now people are playing these Flash games, which they're having fun on, and maybe sometimes they've, you know, derived enough enjoyment from some of these other things, interactive things on the web, that they didn't buy a title that was actually going to pay royalties on. And then the case where it gets downright frightening for them is when you say, well, what if we allow uh, a game or something to download code from the net? Then you're, the obvious case that they say is, well, then people could make mission packs that are downloadable only, and they could avoid the revenue stream, and there would have to be like whatever political pressure could be done on there. But then it goes to the kind of inadvertent case of, well, what if somebody's got that and they've just got a bug? They've got a stack overrun buffer, uh, you know, a stack overrun bug in one of their buffers, and somebody goes to connect to the rogue patch and it downloads the Linux kernel onto their new Xbox. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's a nightmare scenario. <laughs> And that makes it difficult for them to say, it's like, so much of what makes the PC space great from the gaming is this kind of freewheeling, open, you know, try it out, here's a hack and a patch for this, and like, here's all the community sites for this, and like, focus around on the mod development, and taking things apart, putting it together, <coughs> and all that kind of like, flexible changes. And it is true that that detracts from the PC in some ways, if you get a less stable platform just by designing it to have that flexibility. I mean, just the whole basic concept of having device drivers is, Clearly, you know, less optimal in performance and less optimal in terms of stability than having one device, and you just write directly to that. I, you know, we've got a number of players here with Sony, Sega, and Nintendo, and Microsoft now to see how it's going, I, and it'll be interesting to watch their different trade-offs on it. <coughs> where, like, the Microsoft decision to include a hard drive with the Xbox, I, that's a pretty contentious issue, and I'm not. There's plenty of wonderful, good things you can do with it. You can go ahead and like have downloads big save games, you know, streaming stuff off of it uh, for saving, you know, saving demos to it or whatever. But you do wind up then pretty close with all the set, you know, all the problems of the PC. And when you get into flexibility and expansion, you know, again, if you've got the ability to plug in USB devices, again, there's tons of cool stuff that you could do there. But in the gaming market, traditionally, on the console side, there really haven't been any successful peripherals, you know, hardly any, like maybe light guns are, are the most successful thing there. But if you had the option of plugging in like a webcam or something onto your eye, uh, you know, into your new uh, PlayStation 2 or Xbox or something, and expecting that to be able to, to work with the games, it becomes possible, but then it does become like we do on the PC side, where some of the developers will go to all this trouble, support all this tweaky stuff, and you'll still, because you've opened that door, somebody will plug something else in different, and it'll crash the machine or corrupt something, and you'll be in just like in the PC space. Now, in terms of development, I, certainly for our next project, we are still focused on the conventional computer, where you know, we're doing our development. Our, our primary platform is still Windows, I don't know, Windows 2000 right now for main development, but we'll have simultaneous support for uh, Mac and Linux. But the consoles, were, you know, we are spending some quite a bit of time looking at what we want to do there. It's likely that the Xbox will be a, a really trivial, uh, you know, kind of direction for us to port at. There's one. The nice thing about it is the Xbox's hardware capabilities are just almost spot on exactly with kind of like what I'm designing the technologies around. 
high, to the point where that's still going to be a, a moderately high-end PC space console at the time of our release, but uh, nothing terribly aggressive, but it just happens to be exactly at the spot that you know, Microsoft chose to target the console. Uh, the big limitation will be memory, where we'll probably have 128 megabyte required on the PC for our next title, and people will be having you know, 32 or 64 meg video cards, while the Xbox is going to have significantly less memory. So it's likely that we'll be able to have our development process so that even during the game's development, we'll be able to run the game on an Xbox-type platform. But when we're all done with the game, it will have to be the big thing where you go through and kind of pare down and cut things up and more optimize for the specific platform there. But it should be, it's likely that it'll deliver a better experience than your run-of-the-mill PC at the time of its launch because it'll have that extra set of kind of optimizations for it. Uh, it won't perform as well as the state-of-the-art high-end PC. I mean, at the very least, when you're looking at a console like that, you know, you're looking at a relatively low-resolution television, and if you've got your, you know, NV30 whatever uh, at the time frame there, and you're running at 1280 by 1024 with, you know, many, you know, many super sample anti-aliasing, it's just going to look better than anything that you can put on your television. It's just, you know, it's just a matter of having to put four times as many samples there. It's going to make a difference. <coughs> I mean, the Xbox is almost a no-brainer there. It's going to be a fixed, stable platform that's very close to our optimal target design on that. Um, you know, it's, we're not going out on the limb to support that. It's just going to kind of happen automatically because we already support multiple platforms. It's just going to be really trivial for us to do that. And then it'll require the extra pass at the end. So like, it wouldn't be a simultaneous release on something like that because it would need this, you know, this extra quarter of testing and, uh, and crunching and all that. The other platforms are a much harder issue where for the target, the, the technology target that we're designing everything around uh, requires some of these next generation features, basically you know, the crucial ones being like dot product one and cubic environment maps. I, and our media is being designed around utilizing those features. But we will still have a fallback mode of support where I, you know, for older cards, like cards that, you know, that play the game's okay today, like I, you know, Voodoo 3 or, no, it's bad. Uh, Voodoo 4, well, the, the, the reason the Voodoo 3 is a tough issue is because in addition to the, uh, the Dot Product 3 cubic environment maps, uh, stencil buffer is absolutely a necessary frontline feature for the way the new technology works. And even though Voodoo 3 has sufficient fill rate, I, the fact that it doesn't have stencil buffer and doesn't have destination alpha means that none of the kind of really cool new features actually work on those cards. Uh, the, Voodoo, the Voodoo 4 fives are, are fine. I, there's no real problem with that. They've got the stencil buffer, but they don't have the, like the dot product of cubic environment map. So we're going to have this level of our full-on feature set where the media is designed to like really wow everybody and to have the, you know, the brand new features and the high end and what you know, basically everybody here will be wanting to see the game in. Uh, and that will be running on all of the, the kind of next generation cards and everything. And then we'll have the fallback mode where it kind of falls back to still having our basic lighting model. Uh, and so the, the functionality of what you can and can't see stays the same, but it just won't have a good color mapping on there. And that can work at lower speeds on the existing cards. Now, the really tough problem there is that Dreamcast and PlayStation 2 don't have like any of those specific features that we need on there. So it becomes a much bigger issue to go ahead and try and cut the game up into something like that. Uh, and we haven't made any real final decisions on that. We're going to have to sit down and actually play around and see what we can get out of some of those things. Uh, so we do still remain basically PC-focused developers on there. The Xbox is an easy target, but when I have to make those kind of hard architectural decisions where I can look at this and say, I think that the technology that I'm doing now is extremely important and impressive for taking the next step in gaming on the PC. The fact that it doesn't, it doesn't work as designed on the PlayStation 2, likely to be the most successful console. That's one of those things, it's a tough decision, and I look at that, but I'm not willing to go ahead and kind of hold back what I think the right thing on the PC space is, because one of the platforms that we're interested in doesn't have the exact same feature set. So it is likely that whatever happens in terms of PlayStation 2 and Dreamcast for our next title will be very much an after-the-fact port where it's going to take somebody to go in and really redesign things. I mean, that was one thing that worked out nicely on the current Dreamcast version is that I, the Dreamcast hardware, which is basically a power VR type thing inside, is very close and capable to the current set of PC hardware. And the porting process uh, actually worked out where 
uh, a little GL stub was basically, you know, a GL mini driver was kind of written to bring the stuff up. So the game then runs, and that was a wonderful transition point. And then it went to go ahead, and of course, you core out the center of that and then optimize directly for uh, all the paths that count for that. But it's nice to just be able to kind of bring things up like that. And that's probably what we'll be able to do on the Xbox, but we won't be able to do that on any of the other platforms now because these new features that are critical to us on the PC just aren't available there. That's it for part one of the video. Here's a link for part two.